Radio. Radio. News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Hello there, your latest news headlines at six o'clock from GB News in London. Sources close to Penny Morden say she has refused Boris Johnson's request to drop out of the Conservative leadership contest and back him. She's also warned that most of her support would switch to Rishi Sunak if she were to drop out. It comes after Mr Sunak formally declared his bid to take part in the Tory leadership race, saying he would lead with integrity, professionalism and accountability. He added he wants to fix the economy, unite the Tory party and deliver for the country. Well, the deadline for MPs to nominate who they're backing in the Conservative leadership contest is tomorrow. Meanwhile, Leader of the Commons, Penny Morden, says she is the right candidate for the job. What this country needs is a fresh face, someone that can unite the Conservative Party and get things to work in this country. I've got real life experience. I know what people are going through right now because I've been there. I know how complicated their lives are getting, how stressful they're getting, what it's like to scrabble together your pennies to get your fare to work. That is why I'm running to be Prime Minister of this country because people deserve a leader that understands the life that they lead. Thank you. Meanwhile, the Labour leader is being urged to push for a vote of no confidence in the Tories and a warning the following video does contain some flashing images if you're watching on TV. Sir Keir Starmer, as leader of the opposition in the House of Commons, is in fact the only MP who can submit a formal vote to trigger an early general election. That comes after the SNP Westminster leader, Ian Blackford, vowed he'll work with other parties to pass a motion of no confidence. Sir Keir says the government should be focusing on the cost of living crisis and not on a leadership race. Well, look, forgive me if I don't spend too much of my time uh, discussing this absolutely ridiculous and chaotic circus going on at the top of the Tory party, because whilst they're in this circus, millions of people can't pay their bills and they're fed up to the back teeth with this. There is an alternative to this chaos, and that's a stable Labour government. I don't think that wasting our time on the return of Boris Johnson or any other candidate is where the public are right now. They're very worried about the bills they're not going to be able to pay this winter. Their mortgages have gone up because of the chaos and the damage that the Tories have done to the economy. Away from politics, the authorities in Kent are searching for dozens of migrants who dispersed without trace after landing in Dover by small boats this morning. GB News understands around 50 people had been detained shortly after arriving on the coastline in two boats. Police and Border Force are still thought to be searching for the remaining 30 that have escaped. 80 people who made it to the beach this morning were among more than 350 who've crossed the English Channel already today. And a yellow weather warning is still in place for thunderstorms across much of England and parts of Wales. The Met Office is saying heavy rain could lead to flooding with businesses and homes at risk of power cuts and damage from lightning, hail or strong winds. The alert adds transport could be affected, including potential road closures and even train cancellations. The warning is in place until 2am. 
Now, a former wren has received one of the first birthday cards sent from the King and Queen Consort for her 100th birthday. Ruth Park Pearson from North Yorkshire turned 100 on Friday with a card wishing her warmest congratulations arriving the next day, signed by both Charles and Camilla. Mrs Park Pearson, who served in the Women's Royal Naval Service during World War II, says she'll keep the card on display so everyone can see it. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News, the People's Channel. More stories at the top of the next hour. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking wet for some as rain pushes across northern parts with thunderstorms further south. Here are the details. Starting off in the southwest this evening and some heavy showers are likely here, especially around the south coast with the risk of some thunder, hail and squally winds. In the southeast, there will also be plenty of intense thunderstorms throughout the end of the day, which could lead to some localised impacts. Apart from a few showers for South Wales across the rest of the country, it's looking to be a dry end to the day. A similar story for much of the West Midlands with clear breaks to end the day for some. But across the East Midlands, the risk of thunderstorms continues through the rest of the day. The daytime rain should have cleared northeast England by this evening, meaning it will be mostly dry here. Clear skies and lighter winds overnight mean some mist and fog is likely to develop. Meanwhile, it will be a cloudy and blustery end to the day for much of Scotland, with rain pushing northwards. The rain will be heavy, particularly around the central belt. A little rain is possible across northern parts of Northern Ireland in particular, but for many here, it will be a dry evening with clear breaks in the cloud. The rain in Scotland will continue northwards overnight and the showers further south will gradually ease away, some fog developing. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. The Conservative Party continues to destroy itself and to damage the country. Our national credit rating has been marked down. Our mortgages will cost us more. And we must again tremble about the opening of markets tomorrow. We hardly have a government in place should more emergency action be needed in the morning. The new anxiety about Britain is caused by Boris Johnson. If he secures the backing of 100 MPs and his name goes forward to the party's mass membership, he is likely to become Prime Minister again. The Parliamentary Party would send a stern recommendation not to elect him. But that might merely make the mass membership more inclined to do so. Many are livid with MPs for deposing Boris, who was their choice and Britain's choice at the last general election. That's one of the strong arguments for Boris. The other is that he's brilliant at winning elections. He has more charisma in his little finger than the other candidates have in body, heart and mind combined. Even if Liz Truss has put victory beyond reach, Boris might reduce electoral wipeout to mere defeat. But the MPs who support Boris are a fringe element, even if some are in the Cabinet. His premiership ended with 50 members of the government resigning. He would struggle now to appoint a credible Cabinet. Some MPs would quit their seats or defect. The possibility of an early general election would grow. The chaos and psychodrama of the Conservative Party would get worse, not better. Even before Boris's lifestyle and governing skills bring fresh crises and cliffhangers. I know little of Penny Mordaunt, and she's in with a chance, mainly because she's unknown. Ask yourself whether the Tories should take a gamble again on an untested leader. Rishi Sunak commanded respect as Chancellor. That's a weighty recommendation in present circumstances. But the Conservative membership cannot forget that he felled Boris. Tomorrow could be a dreadful day, even by recent standards. Let's say Boris gets 100 endorsements, but trails Rishi by a mile. If Boris's name were to go to the membership, he would win. Amidst party and market turmoil, MPs would plead with him to withdraw his name for the good of the country while Boris would argue that he can win the general election. The Conservatives' best hope is that Boris fails to find 100 backers. Claims yesterday that he had them were unconvincing. 
It suggested that Boris postponed yesterday's parley with Rishi, hoping to build up his number. It sounds as though he's struggling to be on the ballot. GB News's political correspondent thinks that there will be a deal today between Rishi and Boris. But if not, and if Boris appears on the ballot, be afraid. Be very afraid. Uh, in a moment, we'll talk to political commentator Peter Spencer. But first, William Atkinson is assistant editor of Conservative Home, which represents the grassroots members of the Conservative Party. Uh, William, what did you make of my uh, preamble there, my analysis? Well, I entirely agree with it, Michael. Um, and my great fear um, is that as, you know, a, a natural sort of Tory anarchist and journalist by trade, I have a lot of sympathy with Boris. I voted for him in 2019. Um, but I fear if he did manage to get past 100 MPs and he got onto the ballot and then members in whatever sort of online scheme that CCHQ has cooked up um, voted for him, he would, just like Liz Truss has just shown us, fail to command the support of a majority of MPs, he wouldn't command the support of the markets and his second premiership would immediately sort of send into chaos. And I think already the public are not only angry at the Conservative Party, they're laughing at us. And I think if we re-elected Boris Johnson as our leader, they would see us as the farce that we are you know, pretending to be as we are at the moment. And the party would not only, in the next general election, be out of power for a term, but I think it could be out of power for a generation. And beyond that, I think it could actually be wiped out as a political force. I think this is very much an existential crisis for the Conservative Party. And I would say to any MP that's thinking today of backing Boris Johnson that they should think very carefully about the future of our political party. I, I also think it's an existential crisis, but the reason that this might happen is because the Tory mass membership might vote Boris back in. Now, Conservative Home supposedly represents Tory members, so are you saying that the party should have found a way of excluding the mass membership from the voting? Well, so Conservative Home was founded in 2005 to defend um, the right of members to um, have a vote on leadership elections. Um, now, I accept, you know, we, we may back a candidate, you know, we, we sort of broadly backed Sunak in this sort of summer's contest and the members voted for us and it's our job to represent them. You know, in the same way, if the members choose to vote for Boris again you know, this week, we've got to find some way to represent them. But frankly, I would say, and you know, we have said in all the editorials we've done the last few days, that members should think long and hard in the same way that MPs should think long and hard. But you don't think the party should have kept the mass membership out of it? I mean, then, then we'd be in the clear, wouldn't we? If, if the mass members were not voting, we'd be in the clear. I mean, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm by nature, you know, a, a sort of reactionary, hence the tweed and the tie and all the rest. Um, so if, if, you know, if MPs can't come up with a sort of good enough answer, I just had it back to the monarch. But I don't think we're really in that sort of stage at, at the moment. So we are where we are. You know, we, we have accepted since, you know, the 1980s, the Labour Party going first and then the Conservative Party in the 1990s, that members of our two leading parties, should have a say over who the leader is. And in that case, it is the job of Conservative Home, it's the job of media outlets like GB News, it's the job of the papers, etc., to say to the members what we think, as people who are, you know, frankly paid far too much to spend our time, you know, spaffing around talking about politics. And if we can fulfil any sort of useful function, it's to say to the members, you know, frankly, you know, don't go for the option, which I think will be calamitous for both our party and our country. I'm going to go to uh, Peter Spencer, who was uh, for many years with Sky. He's a political commentator today. Um, Peter, what do you think of the idea that there might be a deal? Your ear, I think, is still to the ground. Might there be a deal today between Rishi and Boris, do you think? Well, I can't really see what is in it for Boris. I mean, he's not like the Scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz. He does have a brain. And there's only one job I suspect that he's interested in, which is the top job. And as you have said a couple of times already, if it goes to the membership, the likelihood is he would get that top job. I mean, it's a pretty crazy thing. It seems only yesterday you looked to us in the lobby that I could shoe in for for, for leadership of the Tory party, and then suddenly, by some weird sort of magic, you became one of the greatest Tory le leaders that the Tory party never had. It's a very capricious organisation. Subsequently, you have said to me, you think you were well out of it. Well, I think you were jolly well right. Does the fact that um, there's talk of a deal imply that Rishi either thinks that Boris has or can acquire 
the 100? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, the reality is, of course, we don't know. Every people, people are playing their cards very close to their chest, which is why I think there's so many what-ifs floating around here. But if you just step back and look at the situation that the Tory party finds itself in, and I take the point about an existential crisis, the, the conspirators have barely had time to wipe the blood off their daggers um, before suddenly there is talk of resurrection of the bloke they assassinated. I mean, make sense of that. I mean, I'm, I'm with Larry the Cat here, frankly. I mean, he's been upstaged by the Cheshire Cat, who said, rightly, we're all mad here. But, of course, it all depends who the they in your sentence is. I mean, the they that yes. assassinated Boris are the members of Parliament, and the they yes. who might want to resurrect him are the mass membership, and the two are rather different in their views. Yes, oh, indeed so, and that, and that, that again uh, bespeaks the existential crisis that the Tory party faces. There is this huge schism, and then we go back uh, to Liz Truss making that pitch for what Sunak described as fairy tale economics. Well, the Conservative membership loved all that stuff. Hey, let's be, make, make us richer. Yeah, 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 and look after our pensions, sorted. We love you. And then when it came to it, the markets just said, you haven't a laugh, me old China. And she was off. And, it, and it, if Boris gets back, then the Karl Marx heaves into view for heaven's sake. In the history, repeats itself. First time as tragedy, second as farce. Um, Peter Spencer, it's good to talk to you. I haven't spoken to you for a little while, and it was great to uh, speak to you again. Um, William, you're still with us. Um, how, how do you see this point about how much support Boris may have? What have you been hearing about that? Well, I've, I've heard a couple of sort of contradictory things. So I think yesterday um, we saw very much Sunak having the momentum. He got sort of very big backing in terms of he got sort of traditional Boris telegraphy sort of supporters in um, Charles Moore and, and Lord Frost both coming out for him. Um, and it seemed very much that the backing was, was with Sunak. And then we got this huge sort of announcement from the Boris campaign that he had 100 backers, he was going to be on the ballot. And I think that, that threw... Huge. A lot of they, were, they were giving it a lot of emphasis and welly, were they? Well, I think, I think in the sense that, you know, from what I was hearing and what people were telling me, it, it, it seemed like an attempt to influence what the headlines were going to be on Sunday, sure. frankly. You know, once a journalist, always a journalist, from Boris's perspective. Um, I am slightly sceptical if he actually has those 100 backers, but I think the big thing that we've got to look out for today is that there are a lot of people who back to Liz Truss who haven't yet declared... And frankly, if they backed Liz Truss because she was the candidate that, you know, you know, sotto voce, Boris was backing the last time around, they're probably going to go back to Boris. And if so, he's going to make his way to 100. And the Conservative Party has, has chosen civil war, quite frankly. I think the only way that it can avoid tearing itself apart is if MPs allow a CNAC coronation on Monday. But, you know... I mean, uh, yeah. is Boris devoid of reality? Supposing you've got 100. Yeah. That, that, that's the top limit of his support. He's got to try and form a government. You need virtually 100 members of parliament to form a government. And we know from that list there are quite a lot of people there that you wouldn't very readily put in the government. Is there no chance that Boris will get to 100 and then say, yeah, but it's not enough? Um, and what's the point of trying to rule this party when I've got 250 against me? Well, I think you know, Boris is an incredibly clever man. You know, he, 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 he wait announced the election in 2016, the leadership election, when he realised that he wouldn't have the sufficient support, he didn't want to go through the whole process. And I think if I was him, I would weigh out my options now. I think clearly Sunak is the leader, you know, amongst members, amongst MPs, etc. Not, not sort of party members, but amongst, yes, members, amongst of members, of members of parliament. Yeah. Um, and another thing is that why would you want the job? Frankly, you're going into a winter where you're going to see blackouts, potentially. You're going to see potential shortages. You're going to see potential nuclear escalation in Ukraine. You're going to see potentially seeing China invading Taiwan. You know, it's going to be the worst winter that we've known at least since the 1970s, perhaps, you know, for decades and decades since the Second World War. Who would want to be Prime Minister during that? I, I, I can answer your question. Someone who thinks that he's Churchill reincarnated. Thank you. Many, many thanks to William Atkinson and also to Peter Spencer.
Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12pm. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Many MPs believe or fear that if the membership is allowed to decide, Boris will be reunited with his expensive wallpaper in number 10, even though he still faces an inquiry into whether he knowingly misparliament, misled Parliament over parties during lockdown. Most Conservative Party members are senior citizens, but not all. Some representatives of the younger generation join me now. So, Reem, are your chances of becoming a minister being dashed? What we're seeing at the moment is this huge catastrophe with the, the, sort of the Conservative Party's existential crisis. We don't know which direction the Conservative Party is going in. You know, in the, in the last leadership election, we saw two very different definitions of what conservatism is, right? We saw Rishi Sunak, he's sort of a high-tax conservative, potentially you might even say he's on the left of the Conservative Party. And then you had Liz Truss, who we thought was the free market maverick, you know, Thatcherite type mm. economic. And she completely failed us. And so now we have this existential crisis in the Conservative Party. We need to find some direction, or I think I'm afraid you might be right, we might see the end of the party. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke, one of the things that people are saying is not only might the party go into opposition, but of course uh, a future government might then change the electoral system. A different electoral system would not be as good for the Conservatives, probably, as first past the post. So I put the same questions I just put to Reem to you, really. Uh, are, are you afraid? that you won't see a Conservative government again in your, as it were, useful career lifetime. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, though. I think um, 12 years of being in government comes with a lot of fatigue and a lot of poison in the Conservative Party. Um, there's kind of a lot of dissent amongst the Conservative backbenches, as we just saw on Wednesday. So I think a bit of time on the opposition benches may be a good thing for the party. It might be a good road for self-discovery and kind of refining our free market routes. But it may not be a bit of time. If the electoral system were changed, it might be, well, dare I say it, forever. I mean... Mm -hmm. Conservatives only reappearing in coalitions? Well, it depends on what happens. I mean, if the Labour Party win with a huge majority in the next election, then there's a strong argument for them not to change the electoral system. Um, when the country wants change, there is change. Mm. Um, Anna, to this point about um, what Liz Truss may have done to the party, mm -hmm. I, I don't actually know where you stand in the party, mm -hmm. but I think Reem was putting forward the point of view that the, the, the Thatcherite side of the party has been kind of wrecked by this experiment that went wrong in, in, in 40 days. 
Do you see that as a, a, as a very important moment in you Conservative know, it, history? It, it was very interesting that, you know, that final race between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, both of them tried to market themselves as Thatcherites, even though they had very different policies, I believe, that they were bringing forward. I think it was this idealism that they were trying to sell to the membership, because obviously we were seeing the highest taxes that I believe in 70 years, and I think they were trying to sell themselves as this kind of like Thatcherite icon to, to sell themselves to the membership. And of course, Liz Trust won the election, and we all know how that went in her 44 days. Um, so I just. But however, I, they are trying to sell themselves. Yeah. Is as is the Thatcherite side of the party wounded or, or possibly even dead. But anyway, <laughs> it, it's not going to be in the ascendant as a result of what Liz Truss has done. Is that true? I think that the party is incredibly split right now. Um, I think there's a lot of people, especially with Liz Truss, how she's led uh, herself in Parliament and how it's all gone at the moment with all the U-turns. Um, I think a lot of people are struggling to actually have any faith in the current party and the current government because a lot of people, they didn't really see a stand of ground. They didn't, they, you know, she put forward um, what might, some might say quite a controversial mini budget, and then she U turned on quite a lot of it, even though some of the points on the mini budget were actually quite sensible, and quite good, if given the chance. And I think a lot of people, they've just sort of, they've seen this happen and they now just sort of lack trust in the party and the future of the Conservative Party itself. I would say that it seemed to me that one of the things that she forgot was that Margaret Thatcher stood for balanced budgets. Yes. And, 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 deficit, £2.4 trillion pounds now. Yeah. I think it, you know, it's a result of extremely high amounts of spending that we saw as when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor. So I'm, you know, I'm quite pessimistic to see if, if Rishi Sunak becomes our next Prime Minister. I don't think that I'll be holding my breath for those oh, tax mm. cuts and those reductions in spending. I just really want to say... Let, oh, let, let okay. me just follow up with Sorry. for a moment. <laughs> Reem, isn't the fact of the matter that public spending has moved ahead in a way that Conservatives are not able to control, or anybody else. I mean, the amount we spend on health, the amount we continue to spend on welfare, the amount that we need to spend on the police, on education, on, and so on, I mean, these sums are, are, are not controllable. But that is why the tax burden is higher than it has ever before, been before, because we decided to spend more than You're we ever had absolutely before. right. And this was the huge issue that Liz Truss had. I think she wanted the best of both worlds. Mm. She wanted to cut taxes, but she also unequivocally refused to cut spending. And that was her biggest blunder, mm. I think, in my view, because when we're spending so much, we cannot roll where, it back. Where would you have cut? I would have... Various areas in the government, I think, that need to be cut. So I think healthcare is one of them. We spend just wow. below £200 billion a year on the NHS. And this is no fault of the doctors and nurses themselves, but we've got waiting lists of about £7 million. I mean, it's ridiculous. You would have campaigned on cutting health spending. I, I would, but I think it's more about reform. I think it's about reforming the institution of the NHS. But that's just one area. We spend a ridiculous amount on energy this year. I mean, £150 billion pounds that we're spending on the energy price package was essentially, in my view, a socialist energy policy. It's a blanket approach to energy. Everyone gets the same amount of, uh, of caps. And actually, these larger companies, these larger businesses and larger household income, can, they, they can afford those higher energy bills. And we're subsidising it for everyone and who's paying this tax burden for this tax burden it's going to be our generation yeah. that's going to be continuously paying these high taxes luke it's possible that all of this will soon be quite out of date uh, it is possible that by this afternoon it will emerge that rishi is going to be prime minister and he'll become prime minister tomorrow uh, from your point of view is that now the best possible outcome for the conservative party mm -hmm. Probably, yes. I mean, we've talked about the fact that oh, while he was Chancellor, there was a huge amount of public spending. Obviously, there was the COVID crisis. But a number of chancellors who then became prime minister have kind of become more hawkish with their spending and a lot more kind of Thatcherite, if you will. So mm. I think if he becomes prime minister, it'll probably be the best result. But at the same time, he's going to have a really terrible job. He's going to have to unite the party, kind of set out a vision which is going to unite the parliamentary party as well as the membership. Um, so... I'm not too uh, jealous of that role. Mm. Uh, Anna, if it's Rishi later today and tomorrow, actually becoming Prime Minister, will you be happy with that? Absolutely not. I think that he's a main part of the problem. And I think, especially with Boris Johnson and his, you know, time as Prime Minister, a lot, you know, a lot of the public, they view that his legacy, you know, is one of hypocrisy and lies. And Rishi Sunak, he was one of the most senior members of his cabinet. And he was very, he was very prolific in that. And, you know, especially during the COVID pandemic, you know, going into lockdown, coming out of lockdown, in and out. And a lot of his, you know, policies, you know, the Eat Out to Help Out, for example, that's 
that's why we're in this economic crisis Good that heavens, we're Anna. in. So what's, what's your solution? So my, I think that we need to look in a new direction. We need to find someone within the party, maybe someone that hasn't put their name forward, that could actually lead the party and unite it. Because I think we keep going back to the same old people. We, like, the fact that Boris Johnson Anna, is actually have, a candidate. you have 27 hours. The nomination's I know, closed and, at and 2 o'clock tomorrow. And, you know, it's all happening so quickly. This, I mean, the this fact, fantasy person is not going to emerge. And I, it's a shame. I know it's not going to emerge, and that's a huge shame because at the moment we've only got Boris Johnson versus R Rishi Sunak, and a lot of people are going to think, "What are you going to do any different than we've seen before?" And I think it's, if you want to unite the party and actually make a difference, we need to find that new person to actually bring people together, unite the party that's so divided, to actually move the country forward from what we've seen the last few years. Well, I'm sorry, I, I'm engaged at GB News and not available for this uh, particular <laughs> role. Um, it's such Reem, a shame. <laughs> let, can we end on the highest uh, hopes that, that are possible in the circumstances? If Richie wins today, What's the best that could possibly result for the Conservative Party from that, do you think? I hope so. I hope that he's able to hold off the general election until uh, 2024. That would be the, the best sort of um, uh, outcome because we've, we've got really difficult winter coming. We've got a cost of living crisis. Mm. We've got huge amounts of people now going to food banks and it's a really difficult time, a horrible um, time for energy as well over the winter. So the best scenario would be Rishi Sunak wins, pushes us through till, till the next election. I mean, I have to say, I think we're inevitably going to lose the next election. Um, hopefully, maybe um, you're right in saying that we're able to find ourselves and maybe we'll have a free market liberal back in number 10, but um, I think maybe we've got to be a little bit more optimistic in the future. What a bunch of defeatists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Reem Ibrahim, Luke Warren and Anna McGovern. The deterioration of the Conservative Party's position in the opinion polls has been dramatic. Until the end of 2021, it led its rivals. Even as Boris was being toppled, the gap with Labour was 10 points or less. Now, following Liz Truss's leadership, Labour is 33 points ahead. By the way, nationally, the Liberal Democrats have gained nothing from the Tory collapse. One conclusion might be that the Conservatives face annihilation at the next election. Another might be that, as the memory of Liz Truss recedes, the party might easily limp back to a deficit of 10%, which is not unusual for governments in their midterm. In a moment, we'll discuss what the new leader needs to do to unite the party. But first, let's remind ourselves of how we got to where we are. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, has resigned uh, from the Cabinet. He said it's been an enormous privilege to serve in this role, but I regret that I can no longer continue in good conscience. Yeah, because this, ladies and gentlemen, is not ending with Sajid Javid, uh, Rishi Sunak has resigned his position as we <laughs> speak. Um, goodness gracious well, I, I, li I literally me. just... I and that the public expects us all, all of us, to maintain honesty and to maintain integrity in whatever we do. This is not an abstract matter. We have to conclude that enough is enough. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. Therefore, I give notice that Liz Truss is elected as the leader of the Conservative Union of Parties. Now, ex-Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng has, in the last couple of minutes, tweeted his letter to the Prime Minister, um, which confirms that he was indeed sacked. The Wella Braverman has issued a statement, Darren, is that right? I have concerns about the direction of mm -hmm. this government. Not only have we broken key pledges that were promised to our voters, but I have had serious concerns about this government's commitment to honour honouring manifesto commitments. Mr Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Chaos, and one reason for the chaos might be the lack of leadership skills in politicians today. The British Armed Forces has produced some of the finest leaders in the world, so let's turn to that expertise. Chris Parry is a retired Rear Admiral with the Royal Navy, now lectures in leadership, and Craig Preston is a former Army officer, now an executive leadership coach. Um, welcome to you both. Um, Chris, the thing that strikes me is that politics is so different from the worlds that you two uh, occupy. And let me just spell that out. 
Members of Parliament are not employees and they're not officers and they're not, in, they're not other ranks. They are people who have been elected by a constituency and the constituency is their boss. They will remain in Parliament as long as the constituents continue to vote them back in. Therefore, the job of a leader of a party or the job of a prime minister is not uh, in any way comparable to that of a commanding officer because these people do not owe any natural allegiance to their leader. Do you, do you recognise that in anything you might be about to tell us about how leadership might be improved in politics? I think we have to recognise that leadership is required in every aspect of life in which humans operate. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a politician, a shopkeeper, a partner in a relationship. Uh, leadership is really important if you want to achieve outcomes. And right at the heart of leadership is the ability to bring people together in contexts which are totally different, as you say, in achieving outcomes. Uh, what we've seen with the Conservative Party, and I think in a lot of politics, is a, a real obsession with the ways and means rather than the outcomes. And the sooner people focus on outcomes in whichever way of life, uh, they seek to achieve things, uh, then you'll see a much sharper focus and a much clearer role for the sort of leadership that is required today. Uh, uh, Craig, I would say the, um, the nearest equivalent to your world is that this is a defeated army. This is an army, the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. that has been shattered on the battlefield, uh, that is uh, war-weary. Um, I don't know whether you've come across such, such a situation yourself, but is, is it not in need of the leadership that comes after such a military disaster? Well, I think, um, just to echo uh, Chris's point, that the, uh, the context is, is different here, but the, um, the principles required are, um, are pretty much the same throughout uh, any particular sector. And after a, a defeat or about then, yes, there's a, there's a need initially, for, I think, for people to feel uh, safe, and, and, and secure, and the leader's got to be able to uh, provide that through strength of character, um, a vision for where, where they're going to go. But I think the biggest issue for whoever um, takes over as the, as, as the leader and, and the prime minister, for me anyway, is the need to build a cohesive leadership team cabinet around them, um, because that's what people will look at will be the leader, how's the leader right now, do I feel safe and secure, and what, has they got, what have they got around them that will allow them to deliver outcomes, as Chris um, uh, pointed out before. If they haven't got faith in that, and you've got division in, in that team, then uh, the chances of achieving what you want to achieve are virtually nil. There's, there's also a really important thing about the culture coming from the top. And to quote Peter Drucker, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So, what does that mean? Well, it, it certainly, it, essentially, it means that the, you may have the best plan in the world. You may have a wonderful strategy. But if your culture isn't right and you take the, uh, the culture from the top and it cascades down, then you've got very little chance of achieving what you want to achieve. You can have a mediocre strategy, fantastic culture, and actually achieve it. Let, let me take your point about a united cabinet. I mean, yeah. here, here's a yeah. real decision that the yeah. new prime minister will have to make. Is it more important to have a united cabinet, in other words, to have people who agree with you, or is it more important to have a cabinet that represents the party? I mean, that, that's a very important distinction. I think I just heard you say that it should be a united cabinet, but a united cabinet won't necessarily do if, it, if parts of the party feel unrepresented. No, you're, you're, you're right. When I say united, it means to be inclusive and diverse. So, yes, all views need to be included in some way, but time needs to be spent for people to to build a sense of mutual understanding and mutual trust, even though they might not have exactly the same view, even though they might not be great mates, that there's a, a need that we are working together to a common goal, a common a, a cause that brings us together as a team. Um, Chris Parry, I want to give you a real-life example. Tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, Rishi Sunak could be Prime Minister, and he summons you. And he says, I want to know, I want really practical advice about what I can do in terms of leadership to, to provide the best guarantee of success for my government. Now, you've got, you know, with the Prime Minister, you've probably only got about five minutes. What are you going to say to him? First thing, uh, employ the Roman approach to generals. They employed a slave in battle to whisper in the general's ear. Every half an hour, remember, general, you are mortal. That's the first piece of advice. The second thing is I would empower my cabinet to be deliverers, people who deliver. 
And I would make cabinet meetings about delivering outcomes, not about arguing about ways and means. And my third point would be, do what Abraham Lincoln did, employ a team of rivals. The people who were your previous rivals should be taken into cabinet and made responsible for delivering those outcomes and being collectively loyal. Uh, beyond that, what I would do is convince the country I know what needs to be done. Because the fundamental principle of leadership is knowing what has to be done and then uh, implementing it afterwards. Um, the Greeks had an interesting way of electing their generals, but if they messed it up, they executed them. Um, that's a bit like we're seeing at the moment. Tory party does the same. But, but just to go back to what you said uh, just now with Craig, I don't see the Conservative Party as being defeated. They are still holding the field. Mm. They're assassinating their generals on the field. Mm. That is the problem. And so you're getting no continuity, no loyalty, no focus. Uh, so Rishi Sunak, if it is him, Boris Johnson, if it's him, must empower his secretaries of state. You've, you've been in this role, Michael, OK? And really ruthlessly, rigorously say to them, if you don't deliver outcomes, and that's what I'm imploring you to do, you're out of a job. And I'm going to be telling the country that as well. I have some very unsurprising news for both of you and indeed for the country, which is that uh, Rishi Sunak has confirmed that he is a candidate to be the leader of the Conservative Party and the next prime minister. So he is, I believe, the second uh, candidate to have declared, Penny Mordaunt being the other one, but uh, so far Boris Johnson has not declared. Uh, I don't think either one of you has mentioned victory. I gave you the analogy of the mm -hmm. defeated mm -hmm. army on the field, and I thought you'd say, well, we have to make them believe in the, in the possibility of victory. And interestingly, we had three young Conservatives here a moment ago who were defeatist to a man and mm. woman. <laughs> uh, I mean, is it not worth trying to make them believe that they might win? Well, I, th I think it's a... It's a... Um, a challenge within a, a party political system as to what you think victory is. is you, you hear a, um, a lot at the moment of people saying, you know, victory will be about recovering and winning the next election. Um, actually, shouldn't victory be something that's best for the country? So... Um, oh, that's a good one to well, sell. You know, the the well, best thing for the country will be if we're defeated. Well, none of them were defeated, but um, well, it may be... Actually, one that, of the young Conservatives was saying that. Were they? Yeah, yeah well, I, I think that we've got, almost got to that, that point um, with, uh, with them in terms of a cohesive organisation. They, they do see things very, very differently from one side to the other. But, um, no, vi victory, this goes back to this whole point of the of the cabinet or the senior leadership team. One, thinking that they're a team, and secondly, having a common goal, a common purpose. So I might, and this is really because I know in the, in the politics world, um, where I actually might have to make a small sac sacrifice for the common good, but I need to understand what the common good is. If the common good is we're going to win the next election, is that great for the country as a whole? But if the common good is, let's do what's right for recovering the economy, let's do what's right uh, for... Ma that's Michael, very you, you, I, I take the distinction. Yeah. You go back to Sir Robert Peel. Uh, Robert Peel said, we're going to repeal the Corn Laws because that's great for the country and it's going to triple our GDP. Um, but it's probably going to lose us the next election. And the Cabinet mm. said, ooh, not sure about that. The, the, the Tories are out for, I think, 28 years. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that, that was the point I was going to make. Disraeli was back for one... Brief year as a minority, yeah, yeah. but the Tories were basically yeah, up yeah. 28 years. Do you mind if I ask you about yeah. the cabinet of rivals? Yeah. Because um, the Lincoln case is very, very interesting. So he, he had had three rivals yeah. at the Republican convention of 1859, I guess it must have been, and he brought them into the cabinet. The three of them thought that Lincoln was an idiot yeah. to begin with. Yeah, yeah. To begin with. And over quite a long period of time, he convinced them that actually he was a, a remarkable leader. And some of them became very loyal and very dedicated to him. I, I can sort of see that happening with Rishi. I expect quite a lot of them would think, to begin with, that he was probably not up to it, that he didn't have the experience, that he didn't have the weight. He's not been in Parliament for long enough. I can imagine that over a period of time he might bring them round to thinking that he was something remarkable. Uh, I, I think you, one has to look at the context again. You had the Civil War, of course, which actually galvanised uh, the teamwork aspects that Craig uh, was talking about. I think if Rishi Sunak becomes a Prime Minister and does employ a team of rivals, I would hope that he has a wartime conciliary to whisper in his ear, remember you're mortal, that's the first thing, and secondly, to be able to whip in people that are required. And I'm afraid to say part of the problem is... Uh, the sort of qualities you need to be elected a politician, forgive me uh, about this, Michael, actually make you unfit to lead a democracy. Um, wh why is that? Uh, because you're constantly, I think, uh, swaying with regard to opinion and trying to appease too many 
uh, too many sort of constituencies. And I think unless you're focused by a war, a crisis, or somebody who can hold your feet to the fire, then you're always going to have a problem. Although, although I recall a leader, Margaret Thatcher, who did not oh, well, yeah, do yeah. too much of appeasing constituencies mm. and, and consequently won three uh, general elections. Mm. Um, a last thought from you, perhaps, Greg. Um, I think uh, the, the challenge anyone who's is coming in now will have is so little time. So little time. And we talk about sort of, you know, Lincoln and so on, who developed trust over time. There's, there's, there's little time to be seen. There's this contrast between the long-term strategy. If you take it, I don't know, a football club, for example, long-term strategy, next season, academy, all sorts. But are you going to win on Saturday? Are you going to win on Saturday? So are, are the results, are where we're going to be um, next week where I want to be? Don't want to talk about the, the longer term. So I think that the, the challenge at the moment for whoever's coming in is the next few weeks, next month, couple of months. Uh, I see that. I'm not sure I entirely agree with you, because I think, I think if it were Rishi, he probably mm. would have two years. Mm. Uh, I don't think the Conservative Party is going to remove yet another leader. Well, mm. they might if it were Boris, but not if it's yeah. Rishi. And two years, uh, you know, it's as long as they've been in government. It's quite a long period of time. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Turning to the arts now, uh, this week, Harry Styles returns to the big screen with a starring role in My Policeman. Harry plays Tom, a policeman in 1950s Britain who falls in love with a school teacher on the Brighton coast. However, Tom soon begins a passionate same-sex affair with a museum curator in spite of homosexuality being illegal at the time. Let's have a look at an extract from the trailer to the movie. To all of us. To all of us. All Cheers. Of us. Cheers. <laughs> Consuming. I pity people who don't know what it feels like to be this in love. Come with me, just you and I. He's trying to destroy our marriage. No hiding, no lies. You know nothing about being married to. Stop telling me what I'm supposed to think about it. 
Well, Stephen Kiriazis, who's the arts editor of Express Online, is with me. I believe it's had pretty bad reviews. Is that true? It has. The film itself should be powerful and exciting. The director, Michael Grandish, wants to point out that homophobia, these issues still exist, there's a resurgence, there are important things to discuss. Instead, it plays rather like a polite heritage afternoon movie, um, and it just doesn't have any punch or depth to it, and it's really disappointing. The other side of it is Harry Styles, who it's very hard for him. He's under a huge spotlight, so everybody is, is, is looking at what he's doing. He, <laughs> he's playing a character who's emotionally inarticulate. So you have this problem that he's supposed to be playing someone that's very stiff and uptight and unable to express himself. Whether this is then uh, serendipity or he's giving a masterclass, most people would argue probably not. Um, it's just he is naturally rather stiff. And also, he's very new. He's had no time to, to develop any craft, and it shows. He was in Dunkirk? He was, but in a supporting role. Mm -hmm. um, and you would argue that it would have been wiser to learn a bit of craft, to become part of an ensemble, to watch other people and work his way up. He's been exposed too fast in two leading roles also in Don't Worry Darling. It's too soon. He's not ready. Why does Harry Styles need to become a movie star? He said that the joy for him is um, getting to be someone else, play someone else. And you can understand that, certainly in terms of being himself, idolised by millions. It, it must be an extraordinary, crazy experience, and there must be a huge relief in just letting go, being part of something else, being directed by someone else. And he's talked about that he enjoys the process of pretending which might also be the problem with his acting. He, hasn't, he doesn't believe that acting necessarily comes from within. It's pretending to be someone else. And so he hasn't grasped the need to draw from yourself. But have, you, have you any idea whether he's gone through actor education? I don't think he has. I mean, he was pretty much a school kid, and then he went on TV, then he became a pop star. So I don't think he's had a huge amount of training. So, so in, in that respect, he's at a disadvantage to people absolutely. that he'll be appearing alongside. Sure, absolutely, massively. But also, I mean, you can look way back to the Hollywood studio system in the golden era, and they would just take someone because they had a great face or they were a model, mm. but they would give them intensive deportment lessons, etiquette lessons, acting lessons, everything. He is somewhat, in this crazy world, just been thrown out there. Mm. Poor old Harry. So it's, it, it also sounds like he may have chosen the wrong vehicle. But uh, let's look back in history yeah. at uh, people who went from music to mm. cinema and did well. Um, would Cher be one of our best examples? I think Cher certainly... Cher took 17 years from Sonny and Cher times to actually uh, going... Um, you had Silkwood, you had Mask, you had Moonstruck. That was all in the 80s. She broke through in 65, so she took her time. Mo Moonstruck... Glorious. Mo absolutely glorious film, and she, she was superb mm. in it. Um, I think we there see her at the Oscar ceremony <laughs> in, uh, in a very memorable dress. So she got an Oscar for that. Mm -hmm. um, so she was someone who just was very successful at making the transition. But as you say, she took her time. Do we, do we know whether she was educated as an actor? I think what it was, she had an awful long period where she had her own TV show. And mm -hmm. things like this, they teach you camera craft. You're doing sketches, you're doing improv, you're, doing, you're creating something the whole time. And also there is the sense with Cher... You could say similar with Bette Midler, and obviously we'll get to Barbara Streisand. They are actual natural artists as well. So for mm. them, the joy is always creating, and that's what shines through with someone like Cher, I think. And Moonstruck wasn't a flash in the pan, was it? Because no. she had also, I think, been nominated yes. uh, for an Oscar as Best Supporting Actress in Silkwood. Yes. She didn't get it, but, no. she, but she was nominated. Obviously, a, a pretty good performance. So Cher gets a, a very big tick in yes, this respect. Massively. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara Streisand. Yes. Um, she, she won an Oscar. She did, and absolutely she... For Funny Girl. She got the Oscar. She shared it with Catherine Hepburn, one of those weird ones when you could okay. have a tie right. back in the day. Absolutely. Um, and she actually signed a record deal, I think when she was like 19 or 20, very early on. Um, but then she went onto the stage first. So again, she did Funny Girl on Broadway first. So this is very much exposure in front of a live audience. You learn your craft and you learn your character and you learn how to perform. So, again, there's an awful lot of training in that. We've just, we've just seen her at her Oscar ceremony. Mm. Uh, Barbara Streisand was an extraordinary perfectionist. I remember yes, reading about her obsessive attention to detail. And as you say, she was on the stage for a long time. So that is how she approached 
uh, getting to cinema. Mind you, I, I, I don't know what she was like the first day she was on stage. She may have been uh, pretty nervous about that. I don't know. I think, <laughs> as far as I know, the reviews were incredible from the start. But she'd already been performing in clubs. She'd had her own cabaret show. She'd been performing. And during that, she'd learned the art of also interacting with the audience. So she understands absolutely how to connect on whatever level it might be. Um, and she brings that to absolutely everything she does. And also, I think, with whatever she's done, an immense amount of control. Music stars used to make uh, movies mm. almost routinely, didn't mm. they, uh, in, in the early days? So Elvis made how many movies? He made 31 films. 31 films? He did, and 27 of those were in the 60s across about seven or eight years. How on earth did he have time for anything else? That's absolutely he didn't, amazing. and that was the problem. It, it sort of it destroyed his music career because the films got progressively worse. The music that he was releasing was only related to the films, so it was actually... It wasn't even a double-edged sword. Both sides of the sword for him ultimately were destructive. Um, and also for himself, creatively, he just destroyed himself. It wasn't what he wanted to be doing. Do we think he had talent as an actor? Yes, absolutely. When he did his first um, screen test for the film Love Me Tender, which was originally the Reno Brothers renamed Love Me Tender because his song hit the top of the charts. And it basically, his screen test was excellent. It was shown to other people as an example of natural talent. Paramount Studios wanted to sign him for six pictures. They saw him actually as an acting talent, not just as a hot pop star that they could use to sell movie tickets. It's what happened afterwards, unfortunately, that was the tragedy for him. Uh, that looks like Elvis being uh, kitted out for his um, army mm -hmm. uh, career. Um, Lady Gaga. Yes. Um, now, she's also doing rather well in the transition. She is, and she, she is an... She's a raw performer, and I've seen her various times live on stage, and there's a massive element with her. She creates something on stage in her tours and her concerts where she's creating a fantasy world. So there's a massive element of, again, she understands this concept of creating something else and bringing an audience into it. And she, I would say, rather like Cher and rather unlike someone like Madonna, who's also tried film career but unsuccessfully, Lady Gaga has that raw artistic presence and ill ability to create something bigger than herself. Whereas I would argue someone perhaps like Madonna is unable to forget herself in whatever she's doing, and that's crucially a problem with acting. Lady Gaga is just electrifying whatever she does. Uh, away from the big screen, this week the first new theatre in London's West End for 50 years opened its doors. Soho Place is a 602-seat purpose-built theatre near Tottenham Court Road tube station. A bit of a misfortune, perhaps, to open just now. But what is new about this? Is it the auditorium or is it the things that you can do inside the space or both? It's everything. It's, it's, it's a new look to the area, number one. It's rebranding that part of Tottenham Court Road, which has become rather run down and tawdry. It's a glorious, beautiful building. And I spoke to Nika Burns. And it's important for her just the way that it looks. It's an exciting thing to look at. With inside, on the top floor, you've got an entire acting rehearsal space which means they can be rehearsing one production while another one is on stage. So you have a constant turnover, which is also saving money, which is also allowing actors more time to come in and create what they're doing. They I, I, I occasionally go on the uh, stage myself just, mm -hmm. to, just to do talks, and this new theatre, Soho Place, has this wonderful kind of wraparound mm. feeling. I know that to be on that stage is going to be absolutely divine for anyone who's lucky enough to do that. Stefan, uh, thank you very much for coming in okay. again, and I hope I'll see you again very soon. ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking wet for some as rain pushes across northern parts with thunderstorms further south. Here are the details. Starting off in the southwest this evening and some heavy showers are likely here, especially around the south coast with the risk of some thunder, hail and squally winds. In the southeast, there will also be plenty of intense thunderstorms throughout the end of the day, which could lead to some localised impacts. Apart from a few showers for South Wales across the rest of the country, it's looking to be a dry end to the day. A similar story for much of the West Midlands with clear breaks to end the day for some. But across the East Midlands, the risk of thunderstorms continues through the rest of the day. The daytime rain should have cleared northeast England by this evening, meaning it will be mostly dry here. Clear skies and lighter winds overnight mean some mist and fog is likely to develop. 
Meanwhile, it will be a cloudy and blustery end to the day for much of Scotland, with rain pushing northwards. The rain will be heavy, particularly around the central belt. A little rain is possible across northern parts of Northern Ireland in particular, but for many here, it will be a dry evening with clear breaks in the cloud. The rain in Scotland will continue northwards overnight and the showers further south will gradually ease away, some fog developing. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Britain is poised for its third Prime Minister in about four minutes, while theatres are getting more content warnings than ice cream tubs. Strap yourselves in. This is Free Speech Nation. Britain has a culture of, if it's funny, say it. It's why we're so good at comedy, or we have been in the past. The first comedian I saw epitomised this on our annual trip out of the Scottish hills and into the big city. My mum took me and my brother to see Scottish comedian Jerry Sadowitz. We loved it. Here was a man who said everything we'd been told was wrong to say, who tore into every icon, who exposed his penis without even offering us sweets first. His <laughs> jokes were hilarious and criminally offensive. He had total disdain for the audience as he spat abuse at them. them. The first few rows got soaked in his saliva, which left his hair hanging like wet spaniel's ears. Then he pulled out a super soaker they'd been spitting into all week and sprayed the rest of the room. We begged our mum to take us every year and to get us vaccinated against the hepatitis he probably carried. <laughs> What's happened to comedy? I'm sure people used to go to comedy clubs for the thrill of trans transgression, of being offended by material that's out outside the social norms. Now, people go to get offended and then destroy the comedian's career by complaining. Jerry Sadowitz had his Edinburgh Fringe run cancelled this year after audiences and venue staff complained about the content in his show and about him exposing his penis. But Sadowitz, Sadowitz has been exposing himself on stage for 40 years. He always 